My name is Chloe Valdry, and I'm going to be talking to you today about a concept I created called the theory of enchantment. I'm going to tell you what it is, how I came to develop it, and why I think it's necessary to help us in this moment as a country and to help heal our nation. So the theory of enchantment is really a social emotional learning program that teaches individuals how to develop character, develop tools for resiliency to meet the hardship of life head on, but more importantly, to learn how to love oneself so that one can be able to love others in the process. And the unique aspect of the theory of enchantment is that it uses pop culture to teach a lot of these ideas. So I use Disney, hip hop, pop music, broadly speaking, and other really fun and cool aspects found in pop culture to teach it, but more on that later. First, I'm going to tell you how I developed this concept called the theory of enchantment. So about five years ago, I moved to New York from New Orleans and I got a job at the Wall Street Journal. Now, my background is in international studies and diplomacy. And I was really always interested in this concept of, you know, teaching people how to combat conflict. This is what we study within international relations. But once I got to the Wall Street Journal, I decided to work on a thesis that tackled a topic that was slightly different, not teaching people how to combat conflict, but rather instead teaching people how to love. Now, these two things are actually two totally different things. They are interrelated, but they are not the same thing. So I wanted to teach people or figure out how to teach people how to love. And in order to do this, I asked myself, well, if I want to teach people how to love, maybe I have to ask, what are people already in love with? And how can I use that as a conduit to work backwards to get people to learn how to love? And the biggest source of content for me that shows us what we love as a species, as a society, is pop culture. So all of a sudden, in the middle of this thesis paper that I was working on, I started studying pop culture. This means that I started studying companies like Nike, companies like Disney, singer-songwriters like Beyonce. I wanted to see if there was a common denominator across all these influencers and across all these companies that really demonstrated why we gravitate toward them in the first place. And it turns out there is a common denominator, and it's very, very simple. These companies and these influencers create content where we as the audience see ourselves and our potential reflected in the content. And that's why we gravitate toward it. So for example, Nike. Nike puts out sports apparel and attaches to it the brand Just Do It. And the idea that we have in our minds is that once we put on this apparel, we will be able to accomplish and overcome any obstacle that we have to meet. Very similarly, Disney, every, almost every single Disney movie is a motif, is a metaphor for the human condition. It entails a human being, a flawed hero who is imperfect, who's met with some obstacle, who has to meet that obstacle head on, and in doing so, becomes transformed by that obstacle and emerges heroic. And finally, of course, there's Beyonce. So I don't know about you, but for me and many other women around the world, we see ourselves and our potential reflected in Beyonce's content. So for example, when she says things like, who run the world, girls, we see our potential reflected in that. So this is really the common denominator of a lot of pop culture that we gravitate towards. And I decided to call this phenomenon enchantment. And I called it enchantment because Guy Kawasaki, the former marketing director of Apple, describes enchantment as the process by which you delight someone with a concept, an idea, a personality, or a thing. And it dawned on me that that's really what we're trying to get at. We're really trying to become enchanted by one another, to be full of wonder when we encounter one another. And this is really the step, the key to learning how to love ourselves, and to love one another in the process. So after I wrote this thesis at the Wall Street Journal, I worked for a nonprofit for two years, lectured on it, refined it uh, in colleges across the United States and around the world, and came up with a whole system for teaching this. Now, there are three principles that are really the guideposts for the theory of enchantment. And it's important to understand them because I think that they will be useful in helping us heal our nation in this moment that we're dealing with racism and police brutality 
and really needing to advance towards social justice and social change. So the three principles are very simple and they are as follows. Number one, treat people like human beings, not like political abstractions. Number two, if you want to criticize, criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down, never to destroy. And number three, try to root everything you do in love and compassion. Now you can imagine, even if we as a nation were to implement the first principle, to try to live out that practice in our everyday lives, we would come so far. But we're not doing that at the moment. At the moment, we are prejudging people and treating people not like human beings, but instead like abstractions. We're caricaturing one another, we're stereotyping and reducing one another, and in the process, we're stereotyping and reducing ourselves. So I think that if we were able to internalize and implement all three principles of the theory of enchantment, we could foster better conversations that can help heal our nation and help us move forward. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for that, Chloe. Um, let's dig in and uh, talk about an example. So as you said, you use pop culture as a way to connect to your audience with your pr principles, but it's there's a larger message, as you said, within those references. Um, can you sort of share a thread with us from a movie like Moana or a Kendrick Lamar lyric and link that to, you know, how we resolve conflict? Sure, absolutely. So I teach both Kendrick Lamar and Moana in the theory of enchantment uh, course. I teach Kendrick Lamar in the context of really uh, teaching people the first principle, treat people like human beings, not like political abstractions. And the first question that comes to the to the front of that of that principle is, well, what does it actually mean to be a human being? Um, and one of the things that I teach is that, well, to be a human being is to be imperfect and complex and multifaceted and multidimensional. And in Kendrick Lamar's song, DNA, he says, I got power, poison, pain, and joy inside my DNA. And when he says that, he's really articulating a capacity to be self-aware, to understand that he's capable of producing good and of, produ uh, and of producing harm. He understands that he's capable of both of these things as a human being. So I use that song and that lyric specifically to introduce students to this concept of the complexity of the human condition. And when it comes to Moana, I think that Moana is the best uh, contemporary Disney movie ever made. And what's brilliant about Moana is that it's actually incredibly restorative. Uh, Moana is all about a young warrior princess who lives on this island who's dying. And the reason why the island is dying is because it used to be ruled over by a good goddess named Tefiti. And then her heart was taken from her. And then it was replaced by an evil, rageful goddess named Taka. And uh, I'm going to give it away, but I think we're we're at that point uh, right now. But um, the aha moment that Moana has in the end is that Tafiti and Taka are actually the same being. And once the heart was removed from Tafiti, she descended into rage and became Taka. Which again, as I said earlier, every Disney movie is a motif for the human condition. I mean, this is reflective of how we are as a species. If you remove love, if you remove nurture from us, we tend to descend into rage. So really that film, um, I think, teaches both the first principle, remember that we are human beings and capable of love and rage, but also the third principle, the importance of rooting everything we do in love and compassion so that we can restore each other and ourselves to our higher selves. It makes so much sense to, to use these examples to recognize value in ourselves and, our, and others, but how do you see it fitting in with dismantling structural and systemic issues? So I don't think that one can really tackle systemic issues without centering the individual, without understanding that the individual has to first be able to love themselves, right? And it takes a lot to teach a person to love themselves. It's not something that's necessarily uh, true for a lot of people. We deal with emotional baggage, we deal with insecurities. This is true of every human being. And if we don't have the skill set to love ourselves, we're not going to be able to love each other. Um, if we don't have the skill set to develop a sense of inner contentment um, and a sense of self-worth, then what we're going to end up doing is we're going to project that insecurity onto other people. And then the 
systemic inequality that we're seeing today um, will continue to exist. So in order to change that in a long-term fashion and in a sustainable way, we have to first renew ourselves and make sure that we're healthy and we come into the place in society in a healthy way. It seems hard to value another person who has tried to suppress you um, at a larger level. How do you think about that? So that's a great question. And I, I teach a lot of uh, influential and inspiring work from individuals who have been hosted uh, in the TED community, folks like Daryl Davis, for example, who has successfully, I mean, talk about treating people who treat you badly with grace. Um, Daryl Davis is someone whose claim to fame, in addition to being a famous musician, he actually has gotten hundreds of former KKK members to leave the KKK to give up their roles in the process. Um, and he did this simply by showing um, grace and empathy to these individuals and showing them where they were wrong, of course, but not treating them like they were less than and not treating them like they were um, abstractions, but still treating them as human beings. And we saw that he was able to change the lives of these individuals in the process. And I asked him once, you know, did you not get insulted or offended when these guys were saying really insulting things to you when you were speaking to them? And he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, well, actually, what I thought to myself was, what does that have to do with me? I know who I am. I know that my self-worth, I understand what they're saying is absolutely absurd. So I was able to depersonalize it and not take it personally. And as a result, it didn't bother me. And I thought to myself, yeah, well, that takes a very strong composition and a strong sense of character to be able to do that. And that's really what I'm trying to help teach. Like, how can we develop that strong sense of character so that when someone comes at us in an insulting way, we can depersonalize it and still meet them with grace and with love. Um, one of the things you have critiqued in the current anti-racism discussions is the idea of white fragility. You feel it can be harmful to our progress. Why do you think that? Why do you feel that way? Sure. So I think that the concept of white fragility basically breaks the first rule of the principle of the theory of enchantment. It treats white people as though they were a monolithic being or entity. Um, it treats white people sort of like a conglomerate instead of treating white people as people, as complex individuals or multifaceted. Um, and if we treat any human being or any group of people as though they were a conglomerate, we run the risk of stereotyping them, reducing them um, in our words and in our actions and turning them into an abstraction. And that's not going to be very helpful or sustainable for the long run. We have to treat each other like family. We have to treat each other like brothers and sisters. And only by doing that will we be able to create what Dr. King called the beloved community um, and have compassion for ourselves and for each other, even as we're trying to you know, advance reconciliation and correct some of the things that we're seeing that have been unjust in our society. Well, speaking of community, let's take a couple of questions from our community. Sure thing. Um, so you believe that um, privilege exists for individuals in different ways, but isn't society waiting, waiting privilege for some more than others in, in kind of an overwhelming way? I would say yes in general, but the way I think of privilege is actually, I think, far more multifaceted in the way we sort of discuss it in our, in our common lingo. I think that at all times there are an existing number of infinite privileges that people carry with them. So, for example, a white person may not be followed in a store, right? Whereas I may be followed in a store prejudged because of my skin color. That's an example of what we call white privilege. But at the same time, Another white person might come from a single parent family who may have experienced uh, abuse in the family um, and may be treated a certain way in society as a result of that. Whereas I come from a two parent family, a healthy family, and I may, may be treated differently as a result of that. So there are always at all times a different number of privileges that we bring to the forefront of the social spaces that we enter. And so the question is very simply, how do we treat each other equally at all times? And actually, I think more importantly, how do we treat all of us with compassion and with love, despite the privileges or lack thereof that we bring into society? Okay, we're gonna take one more question from the community. 
from Jediah. I really love these principles, but I'm hoping to hear about bad actors, aka villains, if I understand this framework properly. What happens if and when people reject these principles? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I do think that when people reject these principles, they do sort of become bad actors and they do sort of become villains. One of the things that I teach in the course, which I alluded to earlier, is Disney. Um, and one of the things we study when studying the Disney pantheon is some of the villains. So we study Ursula, for example, from The Little Mermaid, and we study a, a couple others, uh, Lotso Bear from Toy Story 3, for example. And there's a common denominator amongst many of these villains, especially for Ursula in The Little Mermaid through the song Poor Unfortunate Souls. So if you study that song Poor Unfortunate Souls, you'll discover it's actually a textbook example of how people, villains, tend to exploit the insecurities of folks in order to sort of get them to do their bidding. That's what the song Poor Unfortunate Souls is all about. And I think that if you don't practice these principles and if you don't understand the importance of loving yourself and loving others, you're more prone to descend into rage and to ma into madness and become that bad actor and to treat people unfairly, unkindly. And as a result, that will, of course, contribute to a lot of the systemic injustice that we're seeing today. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to hand it off to Whitney and Sandy. Um, what makes you, oh, we have, sorry. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm not sure if we want to ask that. A anyways. Okay. Uh, back to us. Uh, what makes you feel hopeful right now? Well, I think that's, uh, I think we're seeing uh, the, one of the most uh, diverse coalitions right now outside in the streets protesting for racial justice. Um, you know, we're seeing people of all colors and from all socioeconomic backgrounds and even across the political spectrum. Um, I certainly can say that for here in Brooklyn where I am. Um, and that's something I've never seen before. That's not something I've never really read of in American history. And I think it is a testament to the just you know, notion of this moment, the just idea that is really moving this moment and pushing this moment forward. Um, and I hope that it's sustained and I hope that it keeps going. And again, I'm also really excited that it's uh, a lot of millennials. I'm a millennial um, at the forefront of this movement. Um, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by seeing my generation step up and really try to advance social justice. 